Welcome back. Democratic elections over the last decade have produced a number of tough and charismatic Latin American leaders who are radically changing the nature of governance in the region. Two outspoken leaders stand out for their tenacity and attempts to influence policies beyond their borders. It's perhaps too early to tell what legacy Hugo Chavez and Lula da Silva will leave behind, but their regional projects have already transformed the southern continent. We start with Dima Khatib, who followed the Venezuelan leader on his latest globe-trotting mission. Ayer estuvo el diablo aquí. For almost a decade, Hugo Chavez has been hurling insults across the imperial divide. You are a donkey, Mr. Bush. Chalcipote, gringo. Go home. And the White House responded in kind, calling him the most dangerous man in Latin America. He uh, was elected legally just as Adolf Hitler was. But behind the undignified language was a battle for Latin America's soul. Endowed with vast supplies of oil, Chavez mobilized the poor in Venezuela and beyond, at a time of growing resentment against the failures of the World Bank and IMF policies. He's tapped into a, a genuine feeling in Venezuela and other countries uh, about how the United States has treated Latin America uh, historically. In 2002, the Bush administration blessed a failed coup to oust him. That was another great gift by the opposition and by the United States. Like a latter-day liberator, Hugo Chavez launched his Bolivarian 21st century socialism, an alternative to the neoliberal policies and U.S. domination in the region. Chavez has been a factor and it's reinforced and supported, I think, a lot of what's happened in Bolivia, Ecuador to some extent, certainly Nicaragua, Cuba, uh, Honduras. Bolivar was a champion of the union of Latin America. It's uh, part of our mission to develop policy that brings Latin America together. Firmly in power at home, he renationalized the oil industry and redistributed the revenues to his power base, the poor. While abroad, he used his money trying to extend the country's reach. We are detaching ourselves from the dependency of the U.S. empire. No Venezuelan president has traveled as often and as far in the world as Hugo Chavez. He incessantly talks about building an alliance of nations to challenge Washington's domination. I traveled with Chavez on his last tour that stretched from the Middle East to Iran, China, Japan and Cuba. The center of gravity of the world is moving towards the east, and Venezuela is moving towards that center. Wherever he went, Chavez was a sensation. He's been seeking support for regional projects like ALBA, the Bolivarian alternative for the Americas, Chavez's answer to the aborted US-sponsored project of a free trade area of the Americas. It is, like other Chavez initiatives, essentially fueled by oil, and it gives uh, the members of ALBA preferential prices on oil. The money here is the elixir, the lubricant that makes Chavismo stay at the forefront. Hello, Chicago! Then comes the election of Barack Obama in the United States, which seems to have altered his world views. I want to be your friend. It sort of pulled the rug a little from under him or it makes it that much more difficult for him or challenging for him to project himself as this Bolivarian redeemer. The truth is that Venezuela is America's fourth largest supplier of oil and the U.S. is the world's biggest exporter to Venezuela. Even at the height of the clash, the two countries have become more entwined. It's a little bit hypocritical for the United States to lecture other governments to be tough with Chavez when it's the United States that's his biggest market. With most of South America and part of Central America run by leftist governments, Chavez seems to have made Cuba's Fidel Castro's dream come true, becoming the leader of the anti-imperialist left in Latin America. But how well and how long will this left survive remains an open question. Well, to discuss uh, a complex and evolving situation in Latin America, I have with me in the studio Dr. Celia Zusterman. Director of Latin American Studies at the uh, University of Westminster, as well as from Boston, uh, Professor of Law at Harvard, Professor Roberto uh, Mangabera Unger, and here also in the studio, 
is uh, Dr. Mejes Acosta of the Institute of Development Studies. Welcome to you all. Dr. Zisterman, some claim that uh, the likes of Hugo Chavez are becoming increasingly autocrats, they're just populist leaders. Other think that this is an exceptional circumstance in Latin America. The challenges are great, and they will have to take exceptional measures into their own hands. What do you think? I think that Hugo Chavez is not a good, uh, it's not good news for Latin America. Um, I think as uh, one of your commentators has said, uh, he's only um, able to do what he does because uh, of the oil wealth. I don't think he's that popular in Latin America. But is he in Venezuela? He is in Venezuela. Uh, at least we know that he wins elections with over 50% of the vote. It means that he is popular with half of the population of Venezuela. But in a democracy, that's, I guess that's fine. No, absolutely. Absolutely. The problem is that I think Chavez reinforces this view of what, uh, of a very procedural view of democracy in Latin America, thinking that as long as you win elections, then you are justified to do whatever you wish. Uh, Professor Mangabera, do you think that with such exceptional circumstances in Venezuela, especially after a coup d'etat seven years ago, with such challenges from the United States, and with the past history of a fragile Central America, do you think that the likes of, of President Chavez and other members of the ALBA group are over-exaggerating the roles? Uh, I think that the Venezuelan experience should be placed in a larger context. Many of the countries of Latin America now fall into two categories. On the one hand, there are countries that are trying to rebel against the dominant order, but uh, sinking into a swamp of conflict and confusion. And on the other hand, there are countries that are well-behaved and well-organized, but that have signed on the dotted line, that have accepted the institutional formula pressed on them by the academic, political, and economic authorities of the rich industrial democracies. Behind the first set of countries, uh, there's really no idea. And behind the second set of countries, there's a bad idea, that it's enough simply to humanize the inevitable through compensatory redistribution. What is still missing in Latin America, including in my own country, uh, Brazil, is a genuine alternative. Dr. Andres, Central American states are far more fragile than the bigger neighbors to the south, Argentina, Chile, and Brazil, and they have very violent past, and today they also have huge challenges internally. Do you think, at least at the surface, the likes of the ALBA projects, the Bolivarian Alternative, have succeeded in putting a front that could oppose the likes of an imperialist policies coming from the north? Thank you. I think it's not just uh, Central American governments. I, I'd like to bring attention back to the um, domestic factors uh, that have led to the success of uh, Chavez, Correa, Morales in the region, um, which is uh, a long tradition of um, uh, political corruption, lack of performance of political parties, uh, corruption scandals, uh, this uh, belief of citizens in that the workings of democracy as they conceived or as they were promised back in the 80s have indeed produced any uh, meaningful uh, outcomes in terms of policy. And are they uh, today? And they have not. But there's no doubt, uh, Dr. Sisserman, that there are social movements behind some of these people. They are not just autocrats. But they can be both things. They can uh, have the arisen from uh, social movements like uh, Morales. Um, and they can be autocrats as well. And I think Daniel Ortega is, is a clear case. But I also think that it's very important not to put all these people in the same basket. Mm -hmm. They are very different. And Chavez is different from Morales. And Morales himself has been almost an invention of the United States, of the United States' misguided policies in terms of drug eradication and right. uh, affecting the livelihood of peasants in, uh, in Bolivia. Professor Mangabera. In the age of globalization and a changing environment in Washington, Latin America can afford to be divided even on two trends, or is it time for it to unite around one economic or political project, for that matter? The most important social development in our part of the world in the last half century is the rise from below of a new middle class, a dark-skinned, mixed-race middle class in command of the popular imagination. And the revolution that we require is for the state to use its powers and resources 
to help the masses of ordinary men and women follow the path of this emergent middle class. That, however, is not possible without innovating in our institutions. We cannot simply import uh, the institutions of the rich industrial democracies of the North Atlantic countries uh, and then uh, sugarcoat their social effects through compensatory redistribution. Well, I, I want to talk to you about that right after we watch this very interesting report by Teresa Bo about a possible third way that's coming out of Brazil. What are you doing in Brazil? with a leader seen by many as its savior. <laughs> President Obama rates him highly. That's my man right there. <laughs> <laughs> and even says heads of state should learn from him. The most popular politician on earth. President Lula da Silva's newfound popularity also reflects Brazil's power and status in the region. Until recently, Brazil's image was a mixture of carnival, beaches, football, and poverty. But this South America giant now lends money to the IMF, produces more oil than Iraq, and its population of 200 million share the 10th most successful economy in the world. Brazil is a very modern uh, agricultural economy with a huge industrial basis. Brazil accounts for over 50% of the territory, the population, and the wealth of its region. Brazil has transformed its economy from a mere primary producer <laughs> to a technology exporter, competing with Boeing and Airbus in commercial aviation, building the first nuclear submarine in Latin America, pioneering biofuels and high-tech agro-industry. Brazil is now a member of the most powerful regional and international clubs cultivating alliances with India, China, Russia, and all of South America, as well as the West. The president spent so much time on a plane that he's earned the nickname Air Lula. His globe-trotting is changing the balance of power in the region and giving him a platform. It is unfair that the poor be the first to pay the bills of a crisis created by the rich, not by any blacks, by any Indians, or by any poor. Yet not all of Brazil's neighbors are happy with this growing confidence. Within the Andean countries, such as Ecuador, Bolivia, and Venezuela, I think there is an easiness and there is a clear competition. Some on the left accuse Lula of selling out or diluting his party's socialist policies in a country that is still one of the most unequal in the world. But he has lifted 20 million people out of poverty and millions more have joined the middle classes. Brazil is a country that is more sure of itself, is at peace with itself, with its many problems that Brazilians do not deny, but Brazil sees itself as a country that has something to contribute. Well, some have charged that the South-South alignment is just symbolic. President Lula's quiet confrontation with the U.S. aims to chart a truly Brazilian way in the world establishing a middle way between Chavez and the US. The single most important tenet driving Brazilian foreign policy is the search for autonomy. Autonomy in the face of the United States, autonomy in the face of a nasty global capitalist system. Brazil has long been known as the país do futuro, the country of the future. Perhaps its time is now. Dr. Andreas, yes. do you think uh, President Lula da Silva sets an example of how to lead in Latin America? It certainly offers a, a critical case of study, Brazil, uh, because it has been able to reconcile high economic growth through investment with an ambitious agenda for social reforms and poverty alleviation. Um, this is particularly important in, in two senses. One, because it breaks the um, obsolete, I would call it, debate between the traditional right that promoted growth for later redistribution and the uh, conventional left that has always promised redistribution at the expense of a large state. But the second characteristic is that uh, only 20 years or 30 years ago, Brazil was a very weak uh, new democracy. So this is a case of an um, ambitious country that has achieved a lot of progress, starting from no exception than any other Latin American country. 
Uh, Professor Mangabeira, do you think uh, Brazil is succeeding in bridging the gap between rich and poor and presenting a, a third way type model for Latin America? Uh, we have made great advances. Nevertheless, I disagree with the proposition uh, that we have established uh, an exportable model or a third way. Uh, the truth is uh, that uh, this work remains still unfulfilled. Dr. Zusterman, is this possible without political stability? What I, I find surprising in, in the case of Professor Mangabeira Unger is that uh, he seems he he seems to be critical or, or pessimistic about uh, how far Brazil has come. And uh, on the other hand, he recognizes the huge uh, improvements that Brazil has made. And I think that Lula is a man who's got his head very firmly in the center and his heart very firmly on the left. And I think that that combination, to say that we can have follow orthodox or semi-orthodox economic policies. We can be fiscally prudent and serious and responsible. And at the same time, we care about the poor. We care about education. We care about the future. I think, you know, Lula is the man who's actually said it and is doing it. That doesn't mean that Brazil still has got enormous problems. Uh, Professor Magavera Unger, we have an Argentinian intellectual academic here who's accusing you of pessimism. There is absolutely no pessimism in my statement. Uh, hope must be based on, on realism. The truth is that uh, Mercosur and the project of South American Union remains a body without a soul. There is an idea at stake. And the progress of the idea cannot be replaced simply by the star role of individual leaders. Professor Mangabeira, I'm going to take this to Dr. Andreas here in the studio. President Obama says that his story is only possible in America. But when we see a shoe shiner becoming president in Brazil, when we see a woman, a single mother, tortured in previous times, becoming president of Chile, and when we see a Muslim, becoming a president of Argentina. These are encouraging signs of, uh, of societies willing to change. Certainly, Latin Americans have uh, come a long way in terms of uh, democratizing the society and uh, democratizing institutions. I would think, for example, in the case of uh, the ALBA countries um, that... Uh, the Central American uh, republics, uh, yes. Central American, but also uh, Andean countries, yes. uh, Venezuela, Bolivia, Ecuador, where uh, leaders have received a clear mandate to draft new constitutions, and they have crafted and incorporated the demands of the indigenous environment uh, yes. and different sectors with the promise that this is a new institutional um, framework that will lead the path to uh, greater change. However, uh, these leaders have been the first ones to betray their own mandate. Dr. Zusterman, Celia, speaking of changing constitution, one man apparently had in mind changing the constitution. Now he's outside his country being kicked out with his pajamas. And that's pr President Zelia of Honduras. One is and has to always to be against coups yeah. of, of any kind. But it is true that he was trying to change the constitution in order to try to be re-elected. That's, that's an accusation against him. He was just trying to have a, a polling about the possibility of a changing of a constitution. Well, yes, but he was already told both the Honduran constitution actually says that not only are re-elections forbidden, but even to suggest the idea uh, and this is in the Constitution. Of course, it's absurd that it should be in the Constitution. Yes, exactly. But this idea of people cannot be re-elected because this leads to dictatorship is very deep in the Latin American society. What bothers me, Professor Mangavera Unger, is it possible for any leader to be elected for four years and effect the necessary changes in Latin America, or do they have the right to be re-elected more than once? The democracies that exist throughout the world today are democracies that still require trauma to produce transformation. Of course, we should work together uh, to support democratic institutions throughout the hemisphere, but our focus should be in another place. Our focus should be in transforming the Western hemisphere into a vast space for democratic experimentalism. Uh, in that agenda, we should find an ally in the United States, because uh, we are now in a situation in which what we need of the United States is not financial help, 
but engagement in a common cause, which is the reinvention of the market and of democracy for the sake of the ordinary person. On that positive note, we're going to have to end. Dr. Zusserman, thank you so much. Professor Mangabeira Ongar, thank you for joining us from Harvard University back in Boston. And Dr. Andreas, thank you for being here with your studio. And I'll be back with a quick note. The tide has finally turned in Latin America, but no one bothered to tell Hillary Clinton. Contrary to President Obama's quick condemnation of the Honduran military coup, and his willingness to engage U.S. detractors in Central America, his Secretary of State seems adamant on repeating the divisive approach of the other former president, Bill Clinton, who rewarded clients and punished independent-minded leaders to maintain U.S. influence in Latin America. She wouldn't even call the coup a coup. And when the Democratic elected Zelaya tried to keep the world's attention on his country's plight by border crossings and media-grabbing stunts, Clinton called it reckless. It's reckless for Zelaya to reclaim his certified presidency in Honduras, but courageous for Mr. Mousavi to claim a contested presidency in Iran. Rallying Hondurans and the region in light of Clinton's feet dragging is irresponsible. But staring people in Iran is the height of responsibility? Or is it more of the same double standard that the Latin Americans we're hoping the new U.S. administration has abandoned for good. Could someone please pass on to the Secretary of State a copy of the U.S. President's speech to the Organization of American States and underline that part where the, he commits the U.S. to engage its southern neighbors on the basis of mutual interest and mutual respect? Thank you for watching.